Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to wait a few seconds for people to trickle in and then we'll get started. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Um, welcome, one and all, to our fifth Lunch and Learn session. Uh, please remember to submit your questions, comments uh, via the Q&A tab uh, if you're on Zoom and on Facebook Live through the comments section. I'm Katherine Evans. I'm the Deputy Director of Collections and Curatorial Strategies here at the Newark Museum of Art. And today it's my true pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Krista Clark, renowned Africanist curator, independent curator and scholar who um, may be a familiar face to some of you as Krista served for 17 years here at the museum at, as the curator of the arts of global Africa. Her scholarship and acquisitions broke new ground here at the museum uh, and built on the important founding collections uh, that we have had historically. Um, notably, Krista's uh, important volume, The Arts of Global Africa was published in 2017 uh, to coincide with the debut of the galleries that she installed and conceived here at the museum. Uh, and they're dedicated to African art and its global diaspora. Uh, Krista? Over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, thanks for the warm introduction and great to see, well, not see everybody, but thank you all for joining us. Um, I know we have some familiar faces from the past, um, from the museum, people from outside the museum. And so today, um, what I was going to do is talk about the title of my talk is What is African Art? And I'm just gonna take everyone through a spin through some of the highlights from Newark's collection that really speak to the diversity and complexity of the arts of global Africa. So Sylvia, if we could start with the first slide, please. Great. Um, what is African art? It seems like, uh, can go back to the first one, sorry. Um, I starting with this question, um, which is a question that we begin with actually in the gallery at the Newark Museum, which really uh, is meant to speak to the complexity of African art. Um, the first gallery at the museum begins with a quote from the Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie um, from her very well known TED talk, uh, The Danger of a Single Story. And we begin with that quote because uh, one of her main points in that TED talk is that, you know, when you have a single story and that single story is told by a certain, from a certain perspective, it, be, it can become a stereotype. It can become the whole story. And so what we try to do in the gallery at the Newark Museum and today is to really look at the many stories of African art, the many definitions of African art, and to really showcase the idea that there's no singular aesthetic or one definition of African art. Can I have the next slide, please? So I'm beginning with a work, um, one of the early works that came into the Newark Museum's collection. Um, we're looking at a um, work that was created, um, a sculptural tradition that was created uh, for the veneration of ancestral relics in Central Africa. It was made by an unrecorded uh, Kota artist in Gabon sometime in the late 19th century. Um, and I started with this work because I think for many of us, um, this is the kind of thing that we might think of when we think of African art. It's among the most well-known sculptural traditions in all of Africa. And a lot of the reason for that is because artists like Picasso and other mod Western modernists um, studied these works closely and in fact drew upon them their formal qualities um, in creating their own art. So we can even, we're almost looking really at the birth of Western modernism by looking at a work like this. Uh, I wanted to draw attention to some of the details that I find fascinating about this work. Uh, it would have been part of a larger ensemble, would have been placed in a basket 
uh, filled with the certain bones of a deceased ancestor. The practice of creating reliquaries is one that is shared globally. And so this is an example of a Central African practice. And the sculpture itself would have served as a protective device placed on this basket of relics. It's a wooden structure that's covered with metal. The metal is imported from Europe. And you can see that the artist has not only kind of uh, had this very interesting, innovative way of representing the human body in an abstract way, but also used the metal very uh, specifically as a way to kind of highlight the abstraction of the form. So you can look at the copper band, for instance, that goes across the rounded forehead of this figure and how it serves to create a kind of visual distinction between two areas. Um, so I wanted to begin with this. This was a work collected in 1924. It was featured in the museum's very first exhibition of African art, which it was in 1926. And that is among the first exhibi such exhibitions in the country. We can have the next slide, please. So moving on, one of the things that I always uh, really thought was a wonderful aspect of the Newark Museum's collection is that it embraces the whole African continent and it's now its global diaspora and that it includes works from North Africa. About a fifth of the collection is in fact from North Africa. This is a tent panel. Um, this was made uh, in Egypt in Cairo in the 1920s. It's quite large. I don't have the dimensions on these slides but this is almost 10 feet tall. And it was a work that was collected by the museum's founder, John Cotton Dana, who traveled to North Africa, to Egypt, to collect works in the 1920s. It's a work that would have hung um, to create an architectural structure. Um, it is very typically has these uh, Islamic influenced design elements. And you can see that there's an epigram at the top of the uh, tent panel in Arabic which reads, by your wealth, O house, I have attained my dreams. And John Cotton Dina actually commissioned this from these, the, tent, um, the tent makers in Egypt in the 20s, and also commissioned okay. other works which were exhibited in 1929 at the Newark Museum in an exhibition entitled Modern Cairo in a Few Egyptian Antiquities. Um, few museum collections have works like this, and it was exhibited recently. It's a really wonderful work in the Newark Museum's collection. I also just wanted to add before we move to the next slide that this is exactly the kind of work, this tent panel tradition, that inspired the artist Henri Matisse to create his paper cutouts. Okay, we can have the next one, please. So the collection also embraces works from Ethiopia. Um, has a wonderful collection of historical works of uh, Christian um, Ethiopian orthodoxy. And this has always been one of my personal favorites. Um, this is a small piece. It's actually only six inches tall, um, a personal devotional item. It's as you can see, it has panels. It would have been um, the panels open and then they can close upon each other, much like uh, the, a book, the covers of a book. And this was a piece that was created in the mid, mid 17th century, um, probably for uh, a person whose name is Tawadros. And you can see, if you look carefully on the bottom right panel, um, there's a figure line prostrate and that is the donor, the person who commissioned this particular uh, icon for his own religious use. Um, he is asking in the, uh, in the inscription there, he's asking for the Virgin Mary um, to intercede on his behalf, to offer him protection, uh, good health. And so it's wonderful to have this image to coming out at us from the mid 17th century of somebody who actually commissioned this work. Um, it's uh, Ethiopian art is particularly focused on the Virgin Mary and here you see two scenes um, with her in the center holding the Christ child and then a particular um, scene on the right, um, the intercession of the Virgin Mary. 
to the next slide, please. The collection also, uh, the Newark Museum's collection also, again, spans the continent from north to south, including works, many works from South Africa. Um, the collection has a wonderful, um, many wonderful examples of South African beadwork, many large and spectacular examples. But I wanted to showcase some examples of South African beadwork that are rather modest. Um, these necklaces here that you see assembled together um, on a table. Um, these are very modest examples of, of necklaces made in the early 20th century um, by Zulu and Kosa artists in South Africa. And they're special because of also because of who collected these works, um, which is the subject of a, a book actually I'm working on now for the New York Museum. Uh, this, these works were collected in 1938 by a Newark resident, Lida Clanton Broner. And you see her there in the photograph uh, taken at a Newark photographic studio on the left. And on the right, she's seated on the chair uh, wrapped in a fur coat in South Africa in 1938. Um, her story is just amazing. Uh, she is a woman who worked as a uh, hairstylist um, and saved her money for many decades and took a long awaited trip to South Africa uh, on her own in the 1930s uh, on the eve of apartheid, which made traveling throughout South Africa extremely difficult. Uh, she was very interested. She was a grassroots roots political activist. She was interested in linking the concerns of African Americans with those of Black South Africans in the 1930s, um, a kind of early civil rights fighter. And in her journey, she met many people who would later then become the leaders of independent free South Africa. Um, what makes the collection special, in addition to this remarkable story of Lida Broner herself, is that uh, these works were given to her mostly as gifts um, and mostly by other women. And so if you look at the image of the beadwork assembled there on the table, you'll see small tags which have uh, Lida Broner's handwritten notes about who made the works and who gave them to her and when. So they really tell a very rich story about personal connections and relations in 1930s South Africa. And what's also remarkable about this story is that Lida Broner's collection was when she brought it back to Newark, she contacted the director of the Newark Museum and actually ended up exhibiting her collection at the museum in 1943. I think it must be one of the earliest museum exhibitions devoted to South African art and certainly one of the first, if not the first uh, exhibition devoted to um, an African-American woman collector. Uh, so she gave the collection to the Newark Museum in the late 40s um, and her grandsons have recently donated the rest of the collection along with her personal diary, photographs and other memorabilia from this really remarkable trip. If I can have the next slide, please. Photography, um, for some people, it's surprising to see, to, to think of African art and photography. Um, but actually, photography uh, was beginning to be created in Africa within a decade of it, the invention of the daguerreotype in 1839. Um, so there is a long tradition of creating photographic portraits, especially in throughout the continent of Africa. By the 19th century, there were many studios throughout the continent that were run by both local photographers and foreigners. And these studios catered to, to people, individuals who wanted to have their picture made, um, to send to a loved one, to keep in their home. And so in many ways, this studio portrait that you see here by the artist Seydou Keita comes out of a very long standing tradition on the African continent. Seydou Keita is among the best known of the studio portrait photographers. Um, he was active in Bamako, Mali um, from at mid-century. He ran a studio from 1948 to 1963 and took hundreds of portraits of individuals that give us a really unique snapshot of life in and around Bamako, Mali at mid-century as the country was um, leading up to and becoming then independent. 
His studio was based by a train station, which ensured that he had a steady stream of clients. And one of the things um, that makes his portraits remarkable is the kind of collaboration and the way he composed each portrait. So in the portrait here, you have this um, woman um, with this wonderful outfit on, this very vibrantly printed textile. Seydou Keita would have chosen a printed backdrop that would have that complements and um, contrasts in an interesting way visually with the sitter. Um, and collaborated with his sitter, with the woman to kind of work on her pose and to get her just so as he created this photograph. Um, and these were all done in outside studios. I wanted to draw your attention also to something um, in terms of when the museum acquired this. Um, the museum began to acquire photographs from Africa in the 90s, was among the first museums in the United States to look at African photography. And this particular photograph was actually acquired in honor of Ann Spencer, who was my predecessor as, as a curator at the Newark Museum and worked there for 25 years um, and was a really pioneering vision um, for African modernity represented in the Newark Museum's collection. If I could have the next slide, please. The Newark Museum, um, one of the aspects that I tried to bring attention to in my work at the New York Museum was looking at modernist movements um, in Africa and representing uh, works by major modern artists um, in the collection. This is a work by the Sudanese modernist, modernist Ibrahim El Salahi. Um, it's entitled, They Always Appear. And he was a pioneer of modernism in Africa and the Arab world. Um, he was born in 1930. Um, he currently resides in England. He was originally trained in calligraphy and painting, uh, both in Sudan and in London. And beginning in the late 1950s, he began to introduce uh, traditional Sudanese and more broadly Islamic sources into uh, Western academic painting. Um, and so you see here in this particular work, he's exploring the kind of calligraphic, abstract calligraphic shapes. He's interested in seeing what he calls these figural forms that appear in the spaces created through the abstracted calligraphic shapes. So that they always appear refers to this appearance of these figural forms as he's exploring abstraction. Um, he also has a kind of limited, uh, color palette in this work that he felt evoked a kind of Sudanese landscape. Um, so he's one of these artists that you um, have in modernist movements in Africa that are looking at uh, local, specifically African visual sources and combining them with uh, more Western oriented traditions of painting to create works that are offer a kind of modern visual expression and that are really aligned with independence movements in Africa and nation building. I also wanted to mention, there's a photograph there of Ibrahim, a much younger Ibrahim on the bottom with the MoMA director, Alfred Barr in 1965. Um, this was, uh, Ibrahim El Salahi was the first uh, a painting by him, his, him was purchased by MoMA in 1965 and he became the first ever artist to have a, a, from Africa to have a work represented in the Museum of Modern Arts collection. And also a fun fact tying it to the Newark Museum's collection is that the work was exhibited in 1966 in an exhibition of recent acquisitions um, that included artists like Picasso. Um, that was organized, curated by Dorothy Miller, a curator at the Museum of Modern Art, who got her start at the Newark Museum and brought her kind of pioneering uh, vision, looking broadly at visual culture to the Museum of Modern Art. Can I have the next slide, please? Another one of my favorite works is this cell phone coffin, which is actually currently on display in a long-term installation that the Newark Museum created for the Memphis Brooks Museum of Art in Tennessee. Um, this is a, another example of a, a more recent tradition of creating what are known as fantasy co coffins, sculptural coffins in Ghana. 
in the 20th century. Uh, it's a tradition that em emerged in the mid 20th century and came about in part be because uh, in the early 20th century, English colonists um, introduced European co style coffins and they also prohibited traditional funerary practices, which involved carrying the deceased um, on a board, wrapped on a board uh, through the streets as part of the funeral processions. So sculpture, uh, in, in creating this particular sculptural tradition, um, the carvers began to then create fantasy coffins. Um, they didn't want to use the, net, the kind of more boring European style traditional coffins, um, but they were really interested in creating coffins that express something about the individual's identity, personality, um, the elephant that you see there on the screen in the lower right being carried through the street uh, would, is a traditional symbol of power and might it was probably made for somebody who was a chief or a local leader and is being um, carried through the street. This is actually a fairly recent um, photograph that I borrowed from the Facebook website of Pa Joe, who is the, owns, has the workshop um, that made this particular coffin and he's based in Teshi in Ghana. So this coffin takes the form of a cell phone, um, ubiquitous throughout the world, certainly ubiquitous um, throughout West Africa and probably would be made for somebody who wanted to associate themselves or thought of themselves as a, you know, kind of modern tech savvy person. Um, it's a life size uh, a coffin. Um, and as you can see, when you open it up, one of my favorite parts about this work is that you can see that it has on the pillow, uh, this sign, check your voicemail. Um, these coffins, as, you, as I mentioned, are still being used uh, quite regularly in Ghana and they're commissioned um, for different patrons to their specifications of what they want created. Uh, you can see flower sacks, um, uh, sneakers. I, I know that there are probably some, sadly, some coronavirus related uh, coffins uh, happening at this moment. Um, and they're also a tradition that many museums have begun to represent as well and commissioned. And this work was acquired by Newark in 2007. Can I have the next slide, please? Another work commissioned by the Newark Museum um, was uh, one of uh, our major pieces, uh, acquisitions, is this work, Party Time, Reimagine America by the renowned artist Yinka Shonabare. This is a site-specific installation um, that was created to be shown in the Ballantine House. Uh, it's been shown in the Ballantine House uh, on exhibit at least three times. Um, and it was created to honor the museum's centennial and as a way to bring together two different aspects of the museum's collection that uh, are divergent. Um, one is, of course, our wonderful Ballantine House, which um, some of you might have heard uh, former curator Ulysses Dietz speaking about recently, um, built in 1885, a wonderful example of uh, Victorian architecture. And the second is uh, African print cloth, which is what you see these figures costumed in, which is a unique uh, aspect and strength of Newark Museum's collection. Yinka Shonabari is an artist who's very interested in mining history. He's particularly interested in the Victorian era um, and the kind of cultural complexity that emerged in that era, which is also saw the colonization of the African continent. And he started to use the print cloth in his uh, works because it's a way to both signify and question African authenticity. The, these cloths that you see here, these vibrantly hey. pink printed cloths, are often associated with Africa, but they have a history that's much more complex. They were made originally in England and in Holland in the 19th century, originally for uh, clients in Indonesia and eventually for West African patrons. So Yinka Shonobari uses these in a kind of playfully subversive way to question this notion of authenticity in Africa. Again, getting back to this notion, what is African? What is African art? He also has mined the Victorian era for its contradictions. And so in this particular work, 
He was very inspired um, learning about the history of the Ballantine House and of the Ballantines themselves, who were Scottish immigrants who uh, became wealthy within the um, first generation of living in Newark through beer brewing, Ballantine Ale. Uh, and so he decided to create this commission to set it in the dining room of the Ballantine House and to have it explore this kind of uh, discrepancy of wealth that emerged in the Gilded Age, where these dinner parties became elaborate feasts for the ruling class. But he's also made it a little ambiguous and nuanced. The skin tones of the figures are meant to be racially ambiguous. They're not necessarily the white elites who would have originally sat in this dining room. And in this way, Shonabari is also was very interested in exploring Newark's own long struggle for civil rights, which he actually locates in the early 19th century, not in the civil disturbances of the 1960s, and what he describes as a kind of civic invisibility, um, a kind of absence in historical records. What would it be like if different people, different people from different classes and walks of life came to eat in the Ballantine dining room. So these are some of the questions that he's asking us to think about in a work that he describes as a historical intrusion into the Ballantine house and one of the spectacular works at the Newark Museum. Next one, please. So in the final slide here, I'm kind of ending at really the beginning of the African art gallery with again, a work that has um, come to kind of be a, a touchstone for the African collection, if, if there can be such a thing. Uh, this is a work that represents, um, was made by a Yoruba artist in Nigeria in the mid 20th century. Um, it's a man with a bicycle. He's depicted wearing uh, Western style clothes with suspenders and a tie. He has marks of scarification on his face. Uh, he has a bicycle next to him. The bicycle had been introduced into Nigeria in the early 20th century um, and was something that used by, especially by men in palm oil trade, um, something that was practical and functional. And it's unclear what this work is. It's actually very compelling visually, but functionally enigmatic. We don't know whether it was a shop sign, um, we don't think it was made to be performed as a masquerade. And so it really uh, represents a figure who kind of compels us to think about, you know, what life might have been like in the mid 20th century in Nigeria. It's a work that also is significant because it captured the attention of the writer James Baldwin in the 1980s, who actually wrote about this for a, a catalog. Um, and his quote here, this is something. He's one place on his way to another place. He's challenging something or something has challenged him. What Baldwin is getting at and what he's really attracted by in this work is the perspective that it offers on modernity and a perspective that is not necessarily rooted roots modernity in the West, um, but instead says the bicycle is not necessarily a symbol of the Western world, but a reflection of African culture, in this case specifically, um, an existing um, existence in Southern Nigeria, everyday life in Southern Nigeria at mid 20th century. And so to me, this work really embodies the complexity, the hybridity that is the hallmark of New York Museum's Arts of Global Africa collection. Thank you, happy to answer questions. Uh, a, a wonderful uh, path through the many aspects of the collection and those, the multiplicity of the stories that you, you talk about from uh, the beginning through to the end. Um, I have a quick question just to, as I'm so uh, such an admirer of the galleries that you installed. And I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the thematic uh, kind of, uh, orientation of the galleries, uh, given the multiplicity of those stories? Sure. Um, 
it's a challenge. I mean, as I began with, it's such a challenge in any museum to try to represent the complexity of a continent that has more than 50 nation states and also a global diaspora. And so in the galleries, we began with the question, what is African art? Much as I covered in this talk, um, with a very simple selection of 11 works that represent the complexity, many of which are included in this presentation. And then walking through the gallery, um, the central part has several themes, um, broad themes. Uh, one is on art and spirituality. Uh, one is on political power. Uh, one is on adornment of the body. And we tried to draw out these themes by looking at works that were both historical and contemporary. Again, to suggest that you know, many traditions and many continue in Africa, many new traditions are um, being created uh, to, to give a sense of the contemporary relevance of Africa's artistry. And, and then in the last section of the gallery, um, it's mostly a focus on contemporary arts. And the artists in that section that are featured uh, range from artists who are based on the African continent, but again, artists who are now rooted in the US. And that really speaks to the global um, aspect of the collection and the desire to showcase um, the ties um, that, that artists have today practicing in the US and elsewhere to the African continent. Thank you. Um, and when we're all back together, I hope you will, if you haven't seen the galleries, um, experience them. Uh, Joey, we have a, a question from you. Did Yinka Shinabari create the clothing and shoes in party time? Reimagining America, reimagine America. Yinka Shonabari is a, um, he's a conceptual artist um, who works with a, a studio, a team uh, in his studio to fabricate the works. Uh, so he conceptualized the project and worked with a team of, uh, with costume designers, costume fabricators, mannequin creators, if that's a position, um, and other others to source uh, the elements of the dining room table. So, you know, he, he's really the kind of ringleader, artistic mastermind of a team of artists working um, to create a wonderful work like that. Thank you. Charlotte says, thanks for the presentation. Two questions. What's the current approach or strategy towards acquisition of African art? And how is Newark Museum engaging issues around restitution, repatriation, and reparations? Two big questions. Um, I would say, uh, and Krista, chime in here. You were, uh, uh, when you were for 17 years at the Newark Museum of Art, you were uh, expanding the collection in many, many directions, both historically and with cont into contemporary. Our strategy now is really to not silo um, African art, our, uh, African American art, the diaspora into one specific area, but to really think about it holistically and uh, how it um, speaks to many, many aspects of the collection and to many audiences. Uh, so it's not really a um, prescribed uh, traditional approach uh, as we are looking across uh, collections and how they speak to one another is just as important as how they exist within a context, a specific context. Um, maybe Krista, since you're the, our expert, you could speak a little bit to the issues around restitution, repatriation and reparations. Sure, well, that's a very, very big question and very complex. Um, I think in, you know, one of the, one of the rationales for an increased focus we had at the Newark Museum on modern and contemporary art in my tenure there was in large part to avoid uh, collecting works that might have questionable provenance. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, a lot of works in any museum collection lack a lot of data about how they were acquired. Um, 
I think what seems to be in the news most recently are works that were often acquired um, as war booty that were, you know, were clearly outright stolen. But I think many museum collections um, have works that speak to longstanding inequities, um, unequal power relationships. Um, even if they were purchased or acquired in ways that we think uh, are not problematic. Um, so I do think these histories will begin to be examined more closely. And I also think one of the things that makes Newark's collection interesting is that you have a museum director like John Cotton Dana, the founding director, who was actually commissioning works to contemporary works at the time for the collection. And you also have stories like Lida Clanton Broner, who was given these works as gifts. So it's a really complex subject and um, with lots, lots of nuances in terms of collecting histories. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, from Jean. Can you give some clarification of the headpiece on the sculpture in the final slide. That must be the bicycle slide. The headpiece um, on the sculpture in the final slide, uh, we think it's he's carrying something on his head. Uh, it's been interpreted variously uh, as a stack of textiles. Um, I don't think I've ever come across a satisfactory explanation of what it could be. It's a really enigmatic work that, you know, again, might have been made as a shop sign or some kind of advertisement. Um, but it, it probably some item of trade because the bicycle is so associated um, with, with men and with trade. And perhaps an early messenger. Uh, an early messenger. <laughs> Uh, let's see, um, uh, Michael asks, uh, curious to hear more about Albert Barnes's collection at the Newark Museum as we know him more for his collection in Philly, most of which is European Impressionism. Um, that question relates to one of the, the first slides of the Coda Reliquary figure and it's actually, believe it or not, a different Barnes than the Barnes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, so it's it was a piece that came from actually an estate of a Brooklyn collector, Brooklyn-based collector and businessman who traveled to Africa um, and not the Barnes Foundation. But I will add the Barnes Foundation does have uh, one of the nation's first collections of African art. Correct, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, I think that's what we're seeing in the questions. Uh, there's something in the chats as well. Um, can you tell from Larry, can you tell us more about the rise of cubism and modern art and how Picasso and Matisse were similar and different from African art? Um, that is a big question and probably not one I could tackle uh, right off the top of my head. Um, but we know Picasso and Matisse both borrowed heavily from different forms of African art um, and were very influenced, especially by the way ar artists throughout Africa were conceptualizing the human body in abstract ways. Yes, a very big question indeed. Yeah. Uh, with lots of, uh, <laughs> lots of, um, Art historians, curators that have chimed in on this, uh, both in um, you know controversial ways and ways that are more respectful of giving agency to the artists uh, of um, global Africa. Um, there's um, checkered uh, histories there, including from MoMA, correct? Yes. Uh, so um, from Kathy Fellows, who thanks us uh, for the pan for the panel. Uh, I believe you're, uh, Kathy, you're referencing the first slide. Isn't it that the valued aspect of the person are larger? For example, isn't the Nagulu head large to indicate the value of intelligence? Yes, in the first slide, the Coda Reliquary Guardian figure, um, 
it's hard to fit in all you can say about these works. But um, one of the things that's uh, interesting about that work is how the artist has kind of conceptualized uh, and, and emphasized visually aspects that are important, including the head. Um, as a site of intelligence, possibly, but also because uh, some of the, the relics that were contained in these baskets often were included the skull. Um, you know, as which is, you know, as one's, uh, you know, a primary way to kind of continue to communicate with one's ancestors. And so the head is most definitely uh, emphasized by the artist in this case. Um, and the choice of, you know, materials also, uh, there are, if you look closely at that work, there are nails in the eyes, um, which refer a reference to like increased vigilance. And um, the work is also uh, meant to be fairly shiny. It would have been scoured um, with uh, rough sand so that it reflected light. Um, it would have kind of like a dramatic appearance uh, if somebody came into the uh, enclosure where it would have been placed and the sunlight would have bounced off it and kind of as a warning almost. Oh, it's fascinating. Um, uh, there was another uh, question from Judy. Can you tell us more about the book you are writing on Lida Broner and what's the target delivery? <laughs> it's a topic of Krista's and my conversations lately. Um, uh, the, we are trying to wrap up the book, finish the manuscript by the fall and have it out next year sometime. Um, it's a really complex story. It's a lot of archival material, but um, basically my approach with the story is to tell it from the what I would call an object biography. So I'm kind of looking at Lida Broner's history and looking at the objects she collected and what they say about the makers in South Africa, what they say about her own political activism back in Newark in exhibiting these works as a way to draw attention to conditions of Blacks in South Africa in the 40s. Um, and then also how museums, these kinds of collections um, get absorbed by museums and classified and you lose all this rich history. Uh, so those are some of the threads that I'm pulling through in this story. Um, but I hope I like to think that once um, her story, which is quite remarkable, gets out there and some of these photographs, I think there'll be other people who will have many other kinds of stories to tell about her work, her photographs and her life. Krista, one question from Matt, can you, also a big one, can you talk about how the complexities of global technology growth are playing out or being captured in African art today? <sighs> well, again, a <laughs> big question. Um, you know, I, I think uh, there are many different ways. Um, you know, when you, if you are in the Newark area, the person who's asking the question and when the museum opens up again, I mean, one of the interesting ways um, is uh, an artist, Elias Sime, whose work is at the entrance to the African Gallery at Newark, um, who works with discarded computer motherboards and wires that he twists and um, you know works and, and you know hand works to create these very large scale grid-like almost painterly uh, works that have these organic forms. Um, so certainly technology is used as a material um, by artists. Um, there's also you know, many artists today working in Africa with video art. Um, so I think just, I mean, I think artists in Africa, especially contemporary artists in Africa, just as artists, contemporary artists elsewhere, you know, are, are using, you know, the same kinds of sources. Um, in the African gallery as well, um, there is a work, a video work um, by Teo Ashetu. Um, another artist um, originally from Ethiopia, now based in Europe, uh, 
who that is, he's a, one of the earliest video artists um, who has been making videos, I think since the 1980s. Um, so many different ways, again, a really tough question to have a comprehensive answer to. And I think we'll close with one more uh, common question, which I personally love because I think it is such a subtle but important shift in how you presented uh, African art and artists um, and that we're carrying forward in our indigenous presentations and other uh, aspects of the collection. You referred from Mary, you referred to one of the pieces as by an unrecorded artist versus unknown artist. Can you explain the difference? Thank you for that question. Um, that's something I really do strongly advocate for. Um, I do think that there is a difference. Um, you, you see a lot of museums using unknown or unidentified. And what I feel is unrecorded, um, I mean, many of these artists who created works that we don't, in museums, we don't know their names. Um, and that's not because they weren't known in their communities. It often is a reflection of collecting practices where, you know, the people who were outside the cultures didn't necessarily value uh, the artists behind the works, um, didn't think of them as individual artists. And so unrecorded to me puts the burden on us who collected it, those outside the cultures that we failed to capture this data, um, as opposed to suggesting that they're anonymous. Um, so I think it's, it's, I don't know, more of an activist stance in a way um, that suggests that this is really, draws attention to the process of collecting and framing African art, which I think is so crucial um, to the legacy of the way the arts of Africa have been represented today. And, why so many of us are trying to do things very differently. I think that is a tremendous way to conclude our um, chat today. Um, I uh, would uh, say there are more questions and maybe we could entice you, uh, Krista, to return to us sometime uh, as this is an endlessly complex and fascinating uh, aspect of the collections in, in Newark. Um, Thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, and please come back next week, same time, same Zoom, for a conversation with artist Ken Seth. Um, be well, and thank you again. Thank you.